so my, my background is in uh, machine learning. That's what my PhD is in. And um, I've been in the healthcare area maybe for the last 11, 12 years as a P postdoc and a faculty, faculty for the last eight years. And uh, I represent multiple institutions and uh, wear multiple hats. I am a, a senior scientist at SeaKids in genetics and genome biology. I'm also a co-chair of the AI and medicine initiative, which uh, primary goal is to translate AI innovations into clinical care, which is not easy. Um, I'm also an associate professor in the computer science department, and I'm a, a vector member, but I'm also a, uh, Associate Research Director Health at uh, Vector Institute. So uh, let me see a show of hands of how many of you are very comfortable with AI. Like you know, you use, you, you use. Okay, you use. All right, that's gonna be fun. So um, since this is an ethics seminar, I brought all the juiciest problems to you so uh, to simulate some interesting discussion. So first of all, I will define. I feel like at this point we really have to define what uh, AI and machine learning are before we start any talk because of the media and because everybody thinks about different things when you uh, talk about these concepts. So to me, um, I think there are two, two types of AI. There's a general and narrow sense AI, and generalized AI, um, in my mind, until last week did not exist, but I went to Japan last week, and they think about it very differently and define consciousness very differently, so I'm still under the impression of uh, what, what should we say about that in my world, I will just say that generalized AI does not exist yet. Um, what does exist is, is narrow sense AI. And by generalized AI, I mean like this, this super intelligence that can figure everything out and reason and uh, make its own uh, inferences about things that it was never taught to, to reason about. So that to me does not exist yet. Um, narrow sense AI does exist and it's primarily fueled by machine learning. And, uh, but, but there are other areas within the narrow sense AI and that's where you are faced with a particular task and you design an algorithm, a statistical algorithm or otherwise, uh, where uh, you're trying to solve that task. And it is quite frequent that we can solve a specific task uh, or develop a model that can learn from data to perform at a superhuman uh, capacity. It is not hard because humans can only reason within five dimensions uh, comfortably and uh, in healthcare and in many other areas we have to deal with a lot higher dimensional data. So beating a human is not um, uh, super hard. Uh, to the point of usefulness is a different uh, issue. So, and deep learning, a lot of people are talking about the deep learning the revolution. It's a, it's a method or a set of methodologies that exist that are part of the machine learning uh, set of tools and we use it as appropriate for solving particular problems. Deep learning has been uh, very helpful in the uh, vision and imaging domain. It has been less helpful in some of the more uh, constrained data environments where uh, we don't have enough data to apply this high capacity model. So there, were, there are three different parts to my talk. First, I will talk about some of the common misconceptions just to drive some of these definitions home. Then I will talk about uh, some of the uh, methods we have developed in the pediatric space at Sick Kids in collaboration with clinicians. And then I will talk about the challenges. So these are machine learning challenges and beyond. So one common misconception, uh, one I personally encounter very frequently is when talking to people, they think that First of all, they refer to AI as a singular type of uh, thing, like a hammer, right? G let's, let's use some AI here and it'll all work. Um, uh, that is not true, but worse is that people somehow treat it as magic. 
They say, let's like sprinkle some AI or let's unleash AI. <laughs> and to me, it's strange because these are just mathematical models that we use to learn from data. So uh, I, I say, it's, it's not magic, it's math. And then they say, let's call it mathematical. And I say, no, let's not call it mathematical because this is not really uh, a word that exists, neither it is true of uh, what we represent. So there was uh, this, oh no, um, it got cut off. Uh, there was a reference here. This is a paper from uh, Andrew Beam and uh, Isaac Ohani uh, from, I believe, last year where they talked about um, AI and machine learning and the different methods within the space and they nicely uh, kind of categorized the um, Um, on the y-axis as using kind of more human-driven, so 22nd is clinical wisdom, to least human-driven or least human involvement. And that's, uh, in this case, as generative uh, adversarial networks where it actually generates its own data uh, from uh, some of the... Right, so in a lot of this space, there is a little bit of involvement in humans, either designing the algorithm or curating the data, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a, there is a big spectrum of methods. This is just some of them, but there are more. Um, more methods and more come up every day. Uh, the second misconception um, or a common a common thing that you would encounter in the literature and otherwise around AI is that AI is a black box and that machine learning just people just keep designing these black boxes and they're just coming after us all. And um, so it's not really a fair assessment and I think of it as this, we have, all we are doing is we have some input X, we want to map it to some output Y that we want to predict, for example, and this is one type of AI, there is reinforcement learning which looks different, but in general for predictive models, this is what it looks like. We have input X, we have outcome Y, and we are just trying to learn this mapping. And this mapping can be very complex. It could be linear that we are used to, and that's also part of machine learning, or it could be this high capacity deep learning models. And that's what we are trying to learn from data. And guess what? It's actually not very different from clinical practice. This is what clinicians, they infer, they try to infer this, this function f of x, seeing the symptoms, trying to predict the diagnosis or what treatment to follow. And, but they do it kind of based on experience and based on the evidence. Very often this ev ev evidence is outdated. So the clinical guidelines don't get up, uh, updated very often. Um, there's a lot more data that exists that we can do inference on to predict diagnosis better, and that's what AI in healthcare is really trying to do. I think what's really exciting, and this paper came out about 10 days ago on archive, um, is that uh, th there is this strive uh, to build interpretable AI, and um, there is a strive to explain AI models. And there is this paper and there is another paper which talks about how easy it is to manipulate explanations to mislead people about what the model is doing. But uh, this particular paper, it actually uh, formulated a few hypotheses and it tried to test them using uh, various scenarios and gave them to about 3,800 people. And um, so three things, three major findings that they had. How well can people estimate what the model will predict? Of course, it's easier with simpler models. So if a model is clear with few features, people are better able to predict what it will do than some nonlinear model. Okay, so that's no, no, not strange. To what extent do people follow a model's predictions when it's beneficial to do so? They found that there was no significant difference whether the model is clear, simple, or complicated. So that's one, one thing is why bother explaining models if uh, it doesn't matter, the humans will not follow them. But the third is very, very important, is that the, uh, people who follow the clear model, the transparency increases trust, but doesn't necessarily increase understanding of what the model is actually doing. So it can hamper people's ability to detect when a model makes serious mistakes. So a model has made a mistake, people think that they understand the model, and 
they don't recognize this mistake. They don't correct for this mistake. So people who try to build very explainable, very simple models to say, well, maybe it doesn't perform as well, but at least we can understand it, think again. So this is, this is uh, some research that's starting to show that that's not how people actually work. They just blindly trust something and just go with it once they uh, believed it in the first place. But uh, to say this, that AI is a black box and nobody cares is not exactly true, is there's a lot of research in this area, including some of our work. Uh, what clinicians want is uh, we did a survey of clinicians to try to understand what kind of explanations would be useful for clinicians to make uh, decisions and to follow the recommendations of a predictive system, for example. But there, there's a lot of work in this area. Um, Another misconception is that AI is here to replace clinicians. And uh, I, I got this image randomly from EHS today. There are many of those, right? And people are worried that it's coming for us. And I think it's normal because people don't really understand, so there is fear. But um, in our field, because we know of all the drawbacks of AI, and I will list maybe a short list of 10 of them at the end of this, uh, uh, of this talk, this is not what we are trying to do. We are hoping to take very complex data, to distill it, to provide augmentation, sort of in the same way as we have um, images, right? The radiological to see, to try to understand what information is there that a clinician cannot see, sort of like a blood test, right? You have this additional piece of information, except we take all of those different pieces of information and we try to combine them to say, Maybe this is what the risk is. And sometimes we can even explain it using our existing uh, model. Um, I'm going to switch to my uh, projects. Uh, these are just three common misconceptions. There are more. Um, I think that if people have questions, we don't need to wait until the end to ask them because there will be a lot of information in this talk and I would love uh, some participation just to, to know it's the end of the day that you're not sleeping, okay. So um, here are some examples of our uh, projects uh, in pediatrics. Again, I'm giving the handful. Uh, there are many more projects that are ongoing. Um, so w uh, one of the first projects was, was a, a thyroid cancer project with Dr. Jonathan Wasserman. He's an endocrinologist at Sick Kids. And the goal here was to assess the malignancy of um, thyroid module. So the problem with thyroid cancer, which I didn't know before, and I learn every day from the clinicians that I work with, is that you actually cannot detect uh, uh, cancer. You cannot diagnose cancer uh, until resection. You can only diagnose it for sure at resection. So what happens usually is that um, there is ultrasound. Um, First, there is ultrasound. If there's suspicion of malignancy, then they do biopsy. Then if there is suspicion of malignancy, yet again is confirmed, then they do surgery. And it turns out that 67% of surgeries result in benign nodules. So there was no cancer, but the, it was resected anyway. And right now, the surgeries are done well. There are some complications sometimes. Uh, my understanding is that they are very rare, but to the vocal cords, People normally have to take uh, kind of medication for the rest of their life. It affects their quality of life for sure. So we built a method that can try to reduce the 67% the of unnecessary surgeries to 30%. So this is not ideal. It's not reducing them completely. It's not the perfect classifier, but we had a very small data set. And this is actually quite common in healthcare that the data sets that we work with with a particular clinician tend to be rather small, or sometimes the event is relatively rare, or sometimes the RAB was just written from A to B, and there were only so many cases. But the, regardless of the fact, um, even with a smaller data, when the signal is strong, you can uh, get it somehow, and with, with the data that the clinicians are already using in their clinical practice, just taking the features, not even the images, just taking the features from ultrasound and biopsy, we can try to reduce the number of surgeries. Um, 
The second example is uh, Lee found many syndrome. It's a cancer predisposition syndrome. So the way that we define it, it's defined clinically, but the, the, there is an association with a, a TP53 mutation. It's a mutation in an oncogene which um, if it exists, it increases the, can, uh, the risk of cancer in the individual almost to 100% during their lifetime. So it's about 40% before the age of 25. And of course, we are a pediatric center, so we see a lot of kids with uh, cancers with this uh, mutation. And the only hope to really help uh, these individuals is to detect it early. So um, uh, Dr. David Malkin, with whom I work very closely, has developed this Toronto Surveillance Protocol. And uh, it's called Toronto Surveillance Protocol because it's now used around the world. And um, so what, what, what happens is uh, once uh, they test, once they know of the history of this mutation in the family, they uh, start uh, doing the surveillance um, for these individuals. So there's ultrasound where applicable, there's MRI annually, and then there is blood work every four months for this individual just to identify it early. And they have already shown uh, that it actually results, this surveillance program results in significantly earlier detection of cancers and in improved survival. But of course there are challenges. And one of the challenges is that, um, first of all, these this kids, uh, when they have to go undergo whole body MRI, they have to stay still, right? And when a kid is two or three years old, for those of you who have kids, you know it's impossible to explain to a two or three year old to stay still for 15 minutes four time, in four time chunks. It's impossible. So there are particular techniques to how to keep them still and all of them are quite burdensome for the kid and the family. Additionally, what happens is, this is actually a very big burden for the family to have that knowledge, right? Every time they come for the surveillance, they're coming to see whether their child has cancer. So this is, it's hard. It's psychologically very taxing on the families. So what we were hoping to do with uh, David um, was to see whether we can personalize this process a little bit to make it a little bit easier on the families. And um, with a blood draw that is done every four months, you can actually see if you can predict the onset, or whether the onset of cancer happens before the age of six or not, is likely to happen before the age of six or not. So if uh, it is likely to happen, then you need the full battery of uh, tests and procedures. If it is not likely to happen, you can follow up with less invasive procedures than whole body MRI and things like that. So uh, we have about 83% accuracy in detecting whether it can be, um, it's likely to happen before the age of six. Of course, the results are not perfect, but uh, again, it is clinically relevant and you can uh, stratify patients a little bit to, um, to help uh, these families. Um, prenatal hydronephrosis uh, is uh, another condition. So sometimes it's detected prenatally in the mothers and uh, followed up by ultrasound in the kids. So um, it, can, uh, it uh, results in a dilatation of kidney. Sometimes it uh, um, has difficulty peeing or uh, there are infections. It very, very rarely has very severe uh, complications with mortality. So only fewer than 30% of the hydronephrosis infants will require surgery. So they're monitored over time and there is a, like an invasive procedure um, sometimes is required when there is a suspicion that they will need surgery. So it's a, it's a long and drawn out process. And uh, what the students in my lab wanted to do in collaboration with um, uh, a, a urologist at see kids was to, to see whether we can just take the ultrasound, some of the initial ultrasounds and predict whether the surgery will be needed down the road. So it's kind of an early uh, test for needing the surgery down the road because it is actually harder to do the surgery as the kid gets uh, older. But you don't want to do the surgery if uh, they won't need the surgery. So that's why it's a kind of this long drawn out process. So uh, we had an ROC about uh, 93% and pretty good precision recall in this case. Uh, we also use this kind of um, particular saliency map masking where uh, what to pay attention to in the image to say why we, the system has made a decision 
to predict surgery or high risk of surgery that is needed versus the surgery that is not needed, even if it is a severe hydronephrosis. So in this particular case, you can visualize the data and it helps clinicians in that way to, to try to augment their decision making. Um, and finally, maybe some of you have heard, is the cardiac arrest prediction system that we are working. This is a picture of our critical care unit at SickKids. It has about 42 beds, and every bed is instrumented with a lot of different screens, devices, and monitoring tools. And actually, um, Peter Lawson, with who I work very closely, who is the chief of critical care, he compares it to Niagara Falls, why? Because Niagara Falls is about 200,000 cubic feet uh, per second, and this is about 200,000 bytes per second. So uh, they see a lot of data, it's streaming data for all these individuals, and of course it's kind of hard to make a decision real time, and more and more data is now available for this monitoring, so it's, very, it's, it's hard to catch every single thing that's going on. So what we did, was we built uh, one of this, in this particular case, a deep learning system, which predicts uh, risk of um, uh, about five to 15 minutes before cardiac arrest, it predicts the risk. And we have about 70% accuracy of, of detection, uh, detecting cardiac arrest in uh, some of the prospective data, well, retrospectively prospective data that, that uh, um, was available to us. So if you ask, so it seems kind of exciting, we're excited um, to have all these collaborations and to build all these models and to hopefully have a positive uh, effect on clinical practice. Um, I did uh, this poll uh, a while ago and asking people when they think that machine learning will be integrated into clinical practice. People who are more experts, so consider themselves pretty good, um, think that within the next five to 10 years, majority of them think it will, it will happen. It will be uh, implemented in clinical practice. Uh, people who are not sure what AI is, they don't think so. They think it's further away. So people, people who think they're in a know think that we are ready, right? Uh, but, uh, and this is based on Peter Lawson's slides, actually less than 0.1% is integrated into clinical practice. Machine learning was born in part out of statistics and there are many methods that are being used. What is different about AI in healthcare is to you, the previous uh, questioner, it's uh, the fact that you actually need software development to make sure that it runs in the hospital, to make sure that there's, there are lots of different bits of computer science that are also part of it. Now, we think of AI as just the algorithms part and the models part, and in that sense, it's very close to stats. I mean, in stats, they don't use uh, deep learning much, but uh, uh, I recently saw a talk by a statistician from Oxford that was using deep learning. So, um, in the sense that the methods are not uh, dramatically different. Majority of the methods that have been implemented, all the random forests that came out of stats anyway, um, that are not very, very different. What is changing, I think, is this uh, models that can self-update over time. So that is new, but it, that those models are not being built for healthcare yet. So we are just starting to explore how to build that. That will be quite different. But there are a lot of software development challenges. There are a lot of human-computer interaction challenges that are also part of this package of kind of AI in healthcare. We can't really deploy AI in healthcare without those parts of computer science. So then it's well integrated. So one of the challenges is policy creep. So imagine a situation, this, these are all kind of real situations, right? A patient with asthma uh, has pneumonia, comes to the eMERGE. Um, so it turns out that patients who have asthma, it's a precondition for more severe outcomes. So they are treated more aggressively right away. Right, they are triaged. If you have asthma, you will be triaged. So as a result, the outcomes are less severe for asthma patients, right? But we don't actually uh, know that. The system doesn't, doesn't have that you know, consciousness and understanding. And so what the system learned was that asthma is protective and it's good to have asthma. 
for pneumonia. If you have pneumonia, it's really great that if you have asthma too. And so this is, this is actually quite normal, right? And in this case, people saw this and they said, wait a minute, this makes no sense. Even computer scientists could say, look at this and say, wait, this makes no sense. But some cases require a lot more medical knowledge. So this goes back to your question. Um, we're not ready because we don't have the context. A lot of times we don't have the context, the bigger picture, all this policy information, all this medical knowledge that is required for us to actually learn the proper solutions and the proper tools, right? And this is the, the explainability component of the model. This is the model explaining why it made the, the decision for this asthma versus pneumonia patient, right? Um, there are dramatic data shifts. This EHRs, they're constantly updating, they're changing. So this is MIMIC data. And MIMIC data uh, is a public resource, uh, pretty much the only resource that a lot of people use across the board to develop machine learning solutions. And um, there are a lot of solutions that have been developed. So what happened in that system is when they released the data, they added different constant to the time of the event or to the time of the record of the patient. And so all these models that have been learned on uh, those systems and have been published, they perform really, really well. Well, my colleague, uh, Marzia Gassimi, uh, actually was part of the MIT uh, group who's been working from this data from the beginning. And uh, this is the work with our, uh, our joint work with a student we call Supervise that actually got the original uh, data timestamps. Uh, in 2009, there was this transition from one EHR care view to MetaVision. Uh, and none of the systems actually really, uh, really work. So this, this goes back to, yes, we analyze some retrospective data. How does it change things? Uh, if you use the prior year, of course, they recover because at this point, we, we just use the, the MetaVision data as well, and so they start slowly recovering. But the point is that if you use the full history, like have more data, right, have more data, the models do not perform that well. So this is, this is a real situation uh, in a paper that uh, we published uh, recently, and what helped actually is the clinical aggregations. So if you find, um, if you aggregate the raw data in such a way with clinical information that, uh, that makes sense, it is less sensitive to the changes in the data and it actually makes predictions that are um, more robust to the changes in. Uh, but you have to know this, right? You, you have a change, you have to remap the whole thing and that's where a lot of software engineering actually comes in to notice this. There's a, an amazing story actually at Duke with uh, some of our uh, colleagues was that Oracle has replaced a driver for something. And suddenly, half of their fields were not showing up. The risk for the sepsis tool that they have implemented in the practice went to 800%. And it had to do with numerical stability. Like it wasn't really an error in the code, a logical error in the code. It had to do with numerical stability of the, what, whatever they were retrieving from the database. And they didn't detect the difference in the mean because it just, but the, vari uh, the, the mean, the, the variance uh, became crazy. They noticed that the variance, somebody was watching the predictions, noticed that the variance became crazy. And we rolled the driver to make sure that Oracle still has actually that problem. We rolled the driver so that they could still run their solution without the problem. So this is, this is one of the things that it's not, it's not even a machine learning thing, but machine learning has to adopt to this so that the systems that are making prediction actually make sense. In our own, uh, in our own uh, example with, with thyroid cancer, so we had a small, small anecdotal really validation set of 10 patients. Seven benign uh, patients had surgery. We predicted that only two of them have to have surgery, which is nicer. But three malignant patients had surgery, and predi we predicted two out of three. And when we went back to uh, the clinician and we said, we, our system actually had pretty high confidence that this person should not have surgery. What happened? And he said, ah, this patient was very special. This patient's father had uh, thyroid cancer. And so with this particular 
um, you know, uh, lineage, we had to we had to look closer, and we did the extra tests, and we did the resection just in case, and it turned out it was malignant. That information was not at all available to the machine learning algorithm, and so there was no way a machine learning algorithm would not make an error in that case, because everything else looked kind of benign. So the lack of context is key. The, we, the clinicians say, so working with clinicians a lot, they say, they see a patient walking in, and by their gait, by the color of their face, they already are starting to form some kind of an opinion about how badly the patient is feeling, how they're hurt, how severe is their condition. That information is not in, uh, very often is not in uh, electronic health record. But they are making decisions based on this information. So uh, we are actually trying, um, we have th three projects that uh, have a wearable component just to see if we can capture some of this information with the wearables. But this is a, this is a real problem. We don't have all the context. We don't have all the information that the clinicians are using to make their decisions. This is a kind of a classic. I'm sure you've had talks on this, but this happened. So my understanding is within Epic, they are one of the AP APIs that they are sharing with a, uh, with a hospital. Epi Epic is the electronic health record that everybody, all the major hospitals, the majority of the major hospitals use in uh, North America. Um, so they built a classifier of no-show appointment and it's available as part of the system. It turned out that they used basically race and socioeconomic status to make predictions. You know how it was implemented with UCSF? They overbooked all the African-American poor patients, just those. So, and Epic said, wait, it is up to you to make the decision. You know, the signal is there. This is the, the uh, classifier. And they have an amazing data science uh, unit that said, wait a minute. This is not how you do statistical analysis. They went back and they corrected for these factors and they used other factors and they made a better predictor that is not just a discriminator and they are not using this but you know somebody had to go in and say well you can't really implement this uh, you know uh, in, in a way that it was uh, it was it was programmed it's just just really wrong um, of course there are the machine learning and um, simple machine learning uh, problems that are still plaguing even imaging where there has been a lot of uh, progress. So this is a turtle, this is noise, and this is a rifle. How do you feel about that? So this is a rifle because uh, it turned out that uh, there was a recent paper, I think earlier this year maybe, that showed that a lot of this uh, generic, um, imaging deep learning architectures are learning, um, they're learning texture rather than shape. So they actually didn't learn the shape, they learned the texture. And there's a beautiful example where you have a cat, you put the texture of an elephant ear and it recognizes it as an elephant uh, in, in that paper. So um, they have now proposed how to avoid that and you can augment the training sample to make sure that it actually learns shape and they have shown that the same kind of architect architectures have learned shapes. But this is not what actually happened um, uh, for a lot of the, uh, of the methods and you kind of have to keep uh, on top of all this methodology because it's not perfect and we don't know what it's learning. Another uh, beautiful example was uh, before there were the saliency maps and before we actually knew what uh, the imaging uh, data are, um, the imaging algorithms are focusing on, it turned out that it learned all kinds of aberrations or all kinds of annotations and said, well, um, if, if there is uh, a metal token, then it's more likely to be pneumonia or they actually had a triaging procedure that if they suspected a certain level of severity or above, they sent it to a better machine. Not at CKids, another place. They sent it to a better machine. So 
it was complete, the data was completely confounded. More severe patients had uh, different uh, kind of images, and that's what they were learning. They were learning the difference between machines rather than actual pneumonia from the images. Um, so one has to be conscious uh, about these problems. And this is our, this goes back to uh, the point that was raised. Um, it turns out, if we are running this, cardiac arrest, fortunately, is a relatively rare event. There are only 100 cardiac arrests in ICU at SeaKids per year, okay? If this system that we are using is evaluated every five minutes on an average of 30 beds uh, every day of the year, every five minutes, um, we get about three million evaluations. So even if we have a 1% false positive rate, we get about 30,000 false positives for those 100 true positives, right? So this is, this is not even, this is a simple math that was pointed out to us by a clinician. They say, yes, this, this label is great. We, we have identified the label, but the reality is, is that we could not use a tool like this in, in practice. So the question is, what can we use, right? And the question, uh, Right now, we are trying to answer with detection of anomalies with respect to the, uh, that person as the baseline. So building a model, using that person as the baseline to detect anomalies, to detect deterioration. And then if there is an anomaly, if the there is deterioration, it could lead to an event, or it might not lead to an event. But this is something that the clinicians are happy f to be flagged just to keep track of the patient. And that is like we are saying, an augmentation for decision making, augmentation for monitoring. And uh, for that, uh, we actually built uh, uh, a tool that uh, highlights, that built a counterfactual model that uh, highlights the areas why the system has made the decision it has made about increasing the risk. And if it increases the risk and cause, uh, calls an alarm, then it can point, go, going back to the original signal that the clinicians understand, it can point out what aberrations in the signal actually caused uh, the, the, um, the alarm. So um, the way we started working uh, on this is clinicians, usually clinicians come with a problem to us and they say, we want to predict this. And I say, if we build a predictor, would you use it in a clinic? And they say, well, and they say, okay, so what is our goal here? Is our goal here to write a paper? Or is our goal here to develop a tool that might be translated in a clinic? Because if it might be translated in a clinic, then we might be asking the wrong question. And this happens especially in a case where people want us to predict a very rare event, an event that happens less than 5% of the time. These are really, really hard to predict. Uh, especially classification should not be used for this problem. It's really an anomaly detection. They're, they're hard to predict, right? So how hard are we trying? What is our expectations? What are the expectations for the precision recall, for the positive predictive value, negative predictive value? So we start having these discussions. And um, once we design, define what actually our ultimate uh, goal is, then that's fine, and right? We still publish papers, and it's okay to publish papers because it helps us understand the data, helps us to move the field forward, maybe helps to design and inform new machine learning approaches, but if the, trans if the question is translation at the end, then it, the question that the clinician came with is sometimes redefined. Right. One of the biggest problems that we have right now is that is access to data. Um, and this is not just that which data is there, which is not. So this is context that is missing. But people say, oh, we have tons of data. Every time people come to us and they say, well, we have so much data. But what is it in charts? What is it on the slides? What is it, you know, is it an epic? We cannot get access to epic right now. So there are all these, uh, or we are, uh, rather we are slowly starting to get access to epic. So they're collecting, just collecting the data doesn't enable uh, AI. You have to have access to data, you have to have understanding about the data, you have to have some data quality uh, done on this data to understand. I mean, if there's a length of stay and there are 
recorded in five different places and five different places estimates the length of stay differently, we, we don't know how to you know, predict that label because it's, we don't know what the gold standard is. So having access to data is key. Linking it broadly is key to help address some of the issues that were brought up. Uh, and it, it is not, uh, we are trying to do collectively, I feel like as a society, trying to collectively build access to data with Vector and at Sick Kids. But it's, it's moving slowly because, uh, because of the privacy concerns, because of the other issues. And I feel like right now the data is protected from researchers uh, that are trying to help to enable better care. Um, so we already talked about that, which problem to work on. It's, it's hard if uh, there are limited resources, how to figure out how to prioritize this data. Um, clinical champions are key. Working in, uh, in heterogeneous teams is key. So IT has to be aligned if our system is ultimately to be integrated with IT, otherwise nothing will happen. Um, who will benefit? All of these questions have to be defined up front. Uh, translation is actually a very important, very complicated uh, question. What to uh, display, what information to give to the clinician so that the clinician doesn't misinterpret the system, uh, what, this, what the system is meant to do, for example, in that epic case and in the discrimination case. So this was not a clinician, it was an administrator that just took the results of the discriminatory test and just uh, put it in practice and then it was the data scientist uh, that came back and said, please uh, do not use the system. The this, this system is wrong and the administrator, the way it was implemented is wrong. But um, this, uh, everybody has to be on board to understand what the system actually does, what it does for them, what it does for the patients, what it does for all the stakeholders, and how to integrate it into the existing flow that it actually is beneficial, right? There was a study that said there was a, there's more than a 70% burnout due to electronic health record implementation. That's not okay, right? These are technologies that are supposed to help. Um, and of course, ethics uh, uh, and, and education, um, ensuring that the data is properly used, but at the same time enabling the access to data is key. Um, having talks like this, I think, is important for people to know where AI is, what is possible, what is not possible. Uh, how do we share results? Again, part of the translation, there are lots of uh, interesting uh, questions that still need to be addressed. So I would like to conclude by saying there are many successes from the research perspective. There are much fewer successes from the implementation perspective. There is a reason for that. Let's not rush that because it's a very, very important that we do it right. We don't want it to backfire. Uh, we are trying to be very, very thoughtful about how to do it properly, and there are many challenges uh, along the way. So um, they have to be discussed, they have to be addressed. It's still part of research, but I think it's gonna happen. Within five to 10 years, I think it's gonna happen uh, if we all kind of uh, work on, it, on this together. So um, with that, I wanna thank a lot of people. Um, so AI and medicine, uh, uh, this initiative that I'm working with, uh, co-chairing with Peter at Sea Kids, we are, this is what we are trying to figure out. Uh, my amazing lab and all the uh, other people in my lab, my collaborators and, and the funders. And thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer further questions.